Um, I'm going to start recording again. Hi, guys. Uh, so Q&A time. Um, let's... Uh, uh, if anybody has questions, put them up uh, in the chat, uh, and I'm just going to get to a couple of them, I think, because um, I have to go into work early tomorrow. So, uh, what was your favorite puzzle and your least favorite puzzle? God, I, so, Nancy Drew, I think, f um, suffers more than some games. Uh, from the kind of drawn out play that it gets as part of this show. So the fact that I, I, I played Nancy Drew over the course of what, like two months? Uh, I mean, it, like it must have been at least five or six episodes, and, and I know I skipped probably at least two of them. So something like two months. Um, so I, uh, there are a lot of puzzles that I, I like don't recall really clearly because they were two months ago. Um, I mean, in general, the, uh, I, you know, the ideal puzzle is one that's challenging, but I feel like I can solve it rather than guessing at it. And some of the ones that I did tonight, um, like the, the one where I was adding up numbers, I felt like I was mostly guessing at. Um, and the, um, the one, the one that was like, uh, like flipping locks. I actually really liked that one. Um, but I also felt like at least I, I eventually chat gave me a hint about like using the, um, the high and the, the fours and zeros, uh, starting with the fours and zeros. And that helped make it take some of the guesswork out of it. But, um, that I also felt like I was sort of guessing at that one for a while. What was the one? No, I guess it was that one that had an easy version and then a hard version. So maybe it was, maybe that, that was one of my favorites. Um, the clocks, I feel like was a little bit too easy to be a favorite puzzle. Uh, the sliding puzzle was okay. Um, like, I mean, it was pretty good, but, uh, but I also felt like I was flailing a little bit with it mostly because, but I couldn't, I just couldn't like quite fit it in my head. Um, I liked the, uh, the ball bearing puzzle, but it wasn't really challenging enough to, to, um, to feel meaty. Um, I mean, I mostly liked all of the puzzles on like a skit, like they were all pretty good. Um, I, and some of them were just like a little bit too frustrating or felt like a little bit like I couldn't sort of figure out how to approach them. And some of them were a little bit like I just, I got it on like my first try or felt like I did. Um, so maybe the, the one with the, with the numbers from zero to four on the two sides because I also liked that that one had a progression, right? We went from Sudoku to Super Sudoku. Uh, we went from like the easy version of that. And it's a puzzle that I've never seen before, right? Where some of these things were sort of like riddles uh, that if you know, if you can see it, if you, if you get it, if you've seen it before, then um, it's gonna be really straightforward. Uh, Oh, actually, um, the scavenger hunt puzzle was pretty damn good. The, um, the password one, the, on the phone, like, uh, figuring out the password on the phone. I liked that a lot. Uh, the, uh, and I think maybe that one was my favorite actually, cause I had to run around to like figure it out. The second iteration of that, which was the like, 
um, the one that had the digital clock readout that you had to make, I was less enthused by, and that's probably some of that has to do with I've been playing the game for longer now, as in like a literal span of time is longer, um, and uh, and so I've forgotten like more stuff, um, and um, and maybe it. I, like I've already seen a puzzle like that. That was so original. That was so neat the first time I saw it. And I was like, oh god, I have to go like find all of these things and explore a little bit. And some of them, I don't, I'm not sure like what they mean, but I can figure them out. Um, especially where I found at the point where I was when I found this, the cell phone puzzle. Because I could have found that puzzle much earlier in the game and just not had access to that information, but the way that it worked out for me, like that, I felt like that worked out really nicely. Uh, whereas the second one also didn't make as much sense to me in context. It was like, uh, how, who who wrote this? Like, first of all, how, how is that a code to open a briefcase? And then even assuming that like that's a code to open the brief briefcase, obviously Clara didn't like set that code according to this like series of riddle steps. So somebody like uh, reverse engineered it according to like weird if then statements and and left that for me and it and like. Like I didn't like I don't understand contextually how any of that makes sense. Whereas Jessalyn like setting a password or leaving a, a hint about her password based on like things that are findable, that kind of I mean it doesn't make perfect sense maybe, but it kind of makes sense. I like that. Okay, puzzles. I mean generally I like the puzzles. Um <laughs> uh, Sergari noted that uh, he has no reliable way to predict which puzzles you'll, you'll breeze through and which you'll struggle with for 115 years. Do you think that's a product of your relatively low level of Nancy Drew literacy? Um, if not, what do you think is at play? Are there games for which certain people will just always be outliers? Oh gosh, the second part of that question is really interesting, and I don't, I have no idea what the answer is. Um, so, okay, first part first. Um, I think Nancy Drew literacy is a factor, uh, because I think some of these puzzles are um, not necessarily like the same puzzle or the same puzzle form, but they are familiar in the type of thinking that they um, that they require that they utilize uh, and um, it's it is maybe subtle and maybe it's not so subtle but uh, I think that an experienced Nancy Drew player would be better at looking at a puzzle and saying uh, not necessarily consciously but just, you know, as they think about it, framing it in terms of this is a kind of puzzle that I'm used to. Like, this is, this is a way, this is a strategy or an approach to solving this puzzle. And that that's maybe something that I don't always have. I do feel like I sometimes have it. I do feel like there are some puzzles that I come uh, across and I, and I think like, ah, oh, this is probably going to work sort of like this, at least, uh, if not, you know, exactly the way that I think it is, then, then I have some idea of how it's going to work. Um, and honestly, some of that is probably because of Shadow at the Water's Edge, that I have, like, some experience with Nancy, Nancy Drew games, and, uh, and so, like, I, I am leveraging that whether I'm conscious of it or not. Um, but I also think I have a particular way of thinking about puzzles um, and uh, that comes from my personal experience and like 
the kinds of problem solving that I do. Uh, I ha you know I have a background in computer science. Um, I have um, saw a history with like lateral thinking puzzles. Uh, I am okay with numbers, but it's not like math is not like uh, arithmetic is not my strong suit. Um, and similarly, uh, I'm, there are some types of spatial puzzles that I'm, I'm good at, that I have practice with, and other ones that I don't. Um, and so, in general, if I could look at a puzzle and uh, quickly understand how it worked, what all of the systems were, which in general, I think the Nancy Drew puzzles were set up very well to, to make that clear. Um, so if I could understand how all the systems worked and then somehow come up in my head with an algorithm with like some kind of a procedure for narrowing down and getting at the solution to the puzzle, then I would breeze through that. Then that would go really smoothly. Uh, uh, but if I was like, if I spent a lot of time struggling to find that algorithm, uh, or if uh, I couldn't find one, and so I was doing a lot of guesswork, um, then or the 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 heuristic that I found was incomplete, and so I had to like do guesswork on top of it. Then I think that that was a uh, that could really slow me down. Uh, and if I I don't know that there's a really good way to predict how or when or why I would you know, it would occur to me that, um, oh yeah, this is how I would go about solving this puzzle. Um, so, I mean, that's kind of a non-answer. Like, uh, but I think that internally is the process that determined whether I did well or not, whether I like breezed through something or not. Um, and then uh, but there's not really a great external predictor for that. And then um, are there are there games for which certain people will just always be outliers? Well, uh, yeah, I think so. I don't know that there are. I think I think yes, if you look at all combinations of games and people, uh, there will always be outliers. I don't know that that means that uh, there are certain games for which there are a lot like that tend to create outliers uh, or that there are certain people who tend to be outliers. Those are both harder questions. And I guess, um, I mean, I guess, yeah, there are, there are games that uh, like you could certainly imagine that you design puzzles that uh, require a certain skill set uh, or a certain piece of cultural knowledge uh, in order to um, unlock. Uh, and when I say unlock, I, I basically mean that like a lot of these puzzles, a lot of these Nancy Drew puzzles are very like, they, they, I, I keep relating them back to like Towers of Hanoi, right? Um, which if you don't know Towers of Hanoi, this is now the second or third time that I've mentioned it, it's worth looking it up. Um, but it is a very common sort of spatial uh, puzzle, pseudo-spatial, I guess, um, that, uh, you know, if, if you were a naive puzzle solver and you were you plop down in front of the the towers of hanoi then you would kind of like do a lot of randomly sliding blocks around like i did um but if you know what the algorithm is if you know the heuristic if you if you understand like how to solve towers of hanoi then uh it becomes pretty straightforward it's it's just a matter of like recognizing and executing on that algorithm. Um, so, I mean, that, that, that's the kind of thing that would have outliers, right? That would, well, I guess it wouldn't necessarily have outliers so much as it would really separate your player base. You'd have some people who struggled a lot on that puzzle and you would have some people who breezed through that puzzle 
uh, and it would be based on whether or not they they had the experience or the thought process or whatever to like unlock that puzzle. And I feel like a lot of Nancy Drew puzzles are unlockable in that way. That if you get it, if you know or you figure out the like the heuristic, then uh, they become much much easier. Uh, and so any game that that has that kind of puzzle and is set up so that the puzzles are keyed to something so that some people either will get it uh, or won't let like most people will be able to figure it out but some people just don't are missing a skill set or are missing a piece of information uh, that's you know not part of the game that you sort of have to bring in from outside um, then that would create outliers uh, that without that, that kind of game would tend to attract outliers I think um, how do you feel about atmosphere atmosphere building in the Nancy Drew games I think it's generally pretty good. When I'm thinking about this question, I'm thinking more about pacing. Um, in this game, I think this game did pacing a lot better than Shadow at the Water's Edge. Um, but both of them had a good sense of like building in intensity as the game goes on. And in both of these games, and my understanding is that the, there are several subgenres of Nancy Drew games, uh, and one of those is the like scary Nancy Drew games, uh, and Shadow at the Water's Edge and Ghost of Thornton Hall are both within that subgenre. So to some extent, I, I that's my experience. It's only with that subgenre. I actually don't know how that is differentiated from other Nancy Drew titles. But um, at least within that subgenre, I feel like they use the supernatural, the, the sort of threat of supernatural uh, to help build tension progressively over the course of the game and that that's done generally in a really good way and certainly in this game like our ghost sightings became more and more frequent uh like weird stuff happened more and more like there was and surprises came more and more often they were bigger surprises um so all of that i think is good um and the world building is good, especially in this game. Like, there was lots of information about the family and sort of the context in which the family existed. Uh, you know, books about um, spies in during the Civil War. Like, that's, you know, I feel like that's, that, that is atmospheric in a, like, world building sense. Um... And then the conversation, I think, is also pretty good. Like, I, the writing in this game was just sharp all the way around. I don't know that I relate it specifically to atmosphere building. Um, but it definitely kept me engaged. And that's a, that's a prerequisite in a lot of ways to building atmosphere. If I'm, if I'm distracted... Uh, if I'm disengaged, if I'm like, you know, not fully attentive to the game, then I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna feel the atmosphere. I'm not gonna be sort of carried along with it. Um, how do you feel about the game showing you a super real human ghost the entire game, then kind of hand waving it away at the end by saying it was carbon monoxide? seemed an insufficient explanation for how clearly they showed you. Yeah, I, I mean, it is, um, it is super exaggerated. Um, it does not disappoint me because 
I figured carbon monoxide about halfway through the game, and I was sure that that was correct. Uh, I was a hundred percent certain that that's what that the was going to end up being the reason behind all of that stuff. So um, it surprised me not at all, uh, and and so therefore I couldn't really be disappointed by it. Um, it is it is kind of weird. It's a little bit of a weak explanation. I especially feel like they the they. they they try to support that explanation by saying, you know, we think that report Victorian era reports of ghosts were caused by poison, uh, carbon monoxide poisoning, um, and and therefore carbon monoxide poisoning causes visions of Victorian era ghosts. I mean, like causes Victorian era visions. Um, like that, that doesn't really make any sense. Also, I guess maybe my, my sense of the dates is like still way off. I feel like Charlotte died a long time ago, but actually, um, you know, she was contemporary to some of the young adults in this, I mean, you know, younger adults in this game. So that must not have youngish. So she wasn't Victorian. I guess her mother or grandmother was more Victorian era. She looks Victorian era in that crazy dress. Um, I guess my biggest question would be, and I'm sure that this is um, this would make sense logically, but we must see a picture of Charlotte before we see the ghost of Charlotte, right? And then, like, there's nothing supernatural about that. It's just, I think it's, the idea is the carbon monoxide is, like, giving us visions. And our brain, Nancy Drew's brain, is so sort of focused on this idea of ghosts and the ghosts of Charlotte that that is what she conjures. Um, the fact that it, like, looks like a person, I don't know. I don't have a problem with that. I, like... If you've ever been in an altered state, like any kind of an altered state, like like half asleep, uh, um, and experienced something that wasn't there, uh, I mean, it can feel super real, right? Like you are convinced by it, even if in sort of retrospect, the the level of detail that you experienced maybe wasn't as high as a real encounter would be, possibly. But like, but it's possible for that kind of thing to convince you in the way that a dream is convincing, even if it has like varying levels of detail. And I think that, you know, how do you express that in the form of a video game, how do you express that the character uh, whose whose consciousness you are inhabiting as the player of the game has seen something that she is convinced by? Um, how do you express that? I mean, I like I think you express it by showing that like ghostly image of a person right that doesn't seem that weird to me like i i buy that part of it um the fact that those visions are so consistent uh and um the fact that they don't like really fade in and out they just sort of happen uh they, they're very clean cut um and there's not like secondary effects to them they don't happen necessarily while you are uh you know uh feeling dizzy or getting a headache or your vision is blurring like they just they they happen all but all of that seems like pretty exaggerated to me um but the way that they are represented just as like hey i see this creepy ghost woman 
Um, I guess I like that I that I buy. I'm not sure how else you would do it. Um So are you going to play Silent Spy on stream someday? Uh, maybe someday. Not anytime like in the immediate future. Uh, but um, I mean, I wouldn't say no to it, uh, especially if it's recommended by anybody. I mean, I... Uh, uh, Shadow at the Water's Edge was the, the game that a friend of mine who is big into Nancy Drew and watches Mostly Walking... Uh, when we met, she recommended like, oh, you guys should play a Nancy Drew game. You should play Shadow at the Water's Edge. Uh, that's my favorite one. Um, and then once we started playing it, she was like, ah, maybe I actually should have recommended uh, Ghost of Thornton Hall because uh, there's a nostalgia factor or something with Shadow at the Water's Edge, and it's not actually as great a game to stream as it is for me to play. Um, so, I, you know, then when I was thinking about doing a Nancy Drew game for play-by-play, -play, uh, that seemed like the logical choice. Um, if anybody has played Silent Spy and wants to recommend it, um, I would... I would love to hear that recommendation. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed this game, and so I'm, I'm totally open to the idea of playing more Nancy Drew games in the future. Um, we'll see if and when it makes sense for me to play them on stream. That's So that's my answer. Uh, if there's one lesson we can take away from Mostly Walking and Play by Play, it's that playing games for two hours once a week is, is bad. Um... It depends on the game, and it depends on how how it's structured and how you play, and it depends on what you're comparing it to. I will say, so one of the things I I love a lot of things about play by play, but I've been I've been talking um, for whatever reason I've been talking about this a lot. I had my annual performance review this morning and ended up talking about play by play, and. Um, uh, one of the things that has come out of this that I absolutely adore is the community of people who, uh, like hang out with me and play games and talk about them and ask questions and, uh, have insights, uh, and are like really curious and, you know, intellectually stimulated and, and into talking about games together. Um, I love all of that. I love, uh, that's fantastic. That's been like a prize. Uh, but one of the other things that I love about play by play is that if I didn't have like three hours every week that was set aside for playing a game live on stream, um, then I would not have played two-thirds of these games that I've played in the last year. Um, this is, I'm like, this is, this is my time to play video games. Uh, this is like, uh, this doubles as research time for me. And it's not the only time that I ever play video games, and, and there are video games that I, I love to play, and I play to, like, unwind. Um, but this is how I'm, this is making more of a dent in my Steam library than anything in years. Um, so, uh, there's a part of me that feels like if I didn't play video game, if I didn't play Nancy, I mean, definitely, if I didn't play Nancy Drew for two hours every week uh, for the last two months, then I would never have played this Nancy Drew game. Uh, and it was a great game, and it was a great experience, and I learned stuff from it, and now I have, like, references for me to think about when I'm thinking about other games and when I'm designing my own games, and so that's invaluable. Um, so playing games for two hours every week is, is great. It's wonderful. Like, it's better than not playing games. Um, but I understand the point, which is that these kinds of games, especially, that have, like, narrative puzzles, 
that have an expectation of like some kind of consistent thread that runs through the entire experience they are they are seriously disrupted by uh taking that kind of time away um and that i mean that's you know unsurprising and it's it's but it is very much like it's based on the game and how the game is designed and nancy drew like when when the nancy drew team sat down to design nancy drew and when they iterated on it as they produced it when they sort of like brought it through its production cycle uh when they finished that game um their intended audience was not somebody who was going to play it for maybe two hours every week or other week like that's not who they they made this game for and so the game is designed to be played in a particular way one thing that i wish and, and and you know i've talked about this i've been talking about this i talked about this with like firewatch we had a long conversation about uh about you know how how video games and especially narrative games and especially indie narrative games are structured uh and how well that signals to the player how the game is expecting to be played uh and I, you know, I've talked about it before in the context of like, when can I take a break? Like, is this a good time for me to stop? Or should like I wait five minutes because it's gonna be a much better place to stop? Um, and with Nancy Drew, it's it's less that and more like, uh, you're gonna have to remember some of this shit. So maybe like, don't take too long in between sessions. And I feel like Nancy Drew communicates that well enough. Like, I, I, I was not under a misapprehension that, like, this was the proper way to play the game. Um, but this is, this is sort of what I'm working with. So um, I appreciate that the game could be played like this. I sure as hell love the, like, task list checklist thing that we didn't use in Shadow at the Water's Edge because it makes it a fuck lot easier to do that to like keep track of things from from week to week uh and the fact that we didn't have that in shadow at the water's edge is just insane i i don't whatever i'm not gonna but like that certainly made a difference uh and so the game becomes much more accessible to different styles of play uh, to different like player circumstances uh, because of that feature that that is I feel like that's a really important feature um, so for uh, for for anybody who's not in chat um, uh, apparently uh, the silent spy the shattered medallion Labyrinth of Lies and Sea of Darkness are the four more recent uh, Nancy Drew titles that are not available on Steam, at least as of this date. Uh, and um, according to our inside source, The Silent Spy is a pretty solid game with a very emotional slash personal storyline, uh, and the end defenders would absolutely love it. So that's uh, an endorsement, absolutely. I'm not going to jump into another Nancy Drew game right away, um, just because part of what I enjoy doing with this is, um, well, <laughs> I mean, honestly, is like uh, uh, hacking away at my my Steam backlog. Um, but uh, but I will definitely keep that in mind and. Um, and maybe we'll do another Nancy Drew sometime in the future. Okay. Thanks, guys. This was great. I'm going to go... I think I'm going to go to bed and wake up early and do the presentation that I have to do. Um, that's my strategy. That's my build order. Uh, this was... a pleasure as always thank you for joining me uh like i said i will um 
probably not be available for play-by-play -play next Wednesday. Um, I'll announce on Twitter if that changes. Uh, and um, the week after that is GDC, so there would definitely not be a play-by-play -play on Wednesday the following week. Um, if I get a chance, then I will do you know, bonus edition stuff, because that's always fun. Um, but on Saturday, my plan is to just, like, jet out of here and see uh, that superhero movie, Deadpool. Um, so I, I might not be around Saturday. Um, but yeah, yeah, I'll just, I'll be on Twitter and I'll, you know, if um, I'm available to do anything. And uh, I expect that the next play-by-play -play will be three weeks from tonight. Um, so thank you all for hanging out. Thanks for uh, uh, asking questions. Thanks for helping me uh, with Nancy Drew. And um, have a great night. Bye.